Greetings. I was looking at this video by Tahar on his What is the 666 Mark account, which is his main account, from last June, titled Regarding a Discussion with a Member of the Black Hebrew Israelite Sect, which was uh, his video response to a video by Michael Brown, uh, presumably from the same month. And uh, there's an interesting part in there where he explores the issue of why chromosomal DNA, uh, which is to say the the distinct paternal line within DNA, the, the Y haplogroup. So I'd like to play a couple minutes from his video and then discuss the implications of his position. Here we go. Now I have a chart and I'll bring it out in the near future. It gives you a list of uh, the various African nations, peoples, and it gives you the percentage of the E1B1A, um, Heplogroup E1B1A. And y'all should study that. Go go to Google, put Heplogroup, Heplogroup E1B1A, uh, uh, Heplogroup E1B1A, Africans, Heplogroup E1B1A, Israelites. Now this particular uh, chart matter of fact um i may just show you the chart if you look at the chart you you'll see you'll notice that uh and i'll leave the uh, link in the description box so you can look at the chart and you'll notice that every group in the chart that has an e1b1a mark i guess you call it are uh, west africans if you go to maps you put a picture you you hit image it will only show you the the west central to west africa um that's the e1 b1a uh group um group or heplogroup. group when you come across the people of ethiopia the people of sudan they're not e1 b1a so it's showing you that that africans are not one common people you know it has it, it it's it has to be that these uh west africans nigerians people of ghana mali um they had to come from somewhere else all right the the suit the suited we don't um the suit the people of sudan the people of ethiopia the, the people of east africa for the most part and you have some israelites mingled among them are not the same people as the West Africans, man. We don't have a common uh, gene. So there's at least two different types of people in Africa so far. The people of Sudan, the people of Ethiopia are not, they do, they do not possess the haplogroup E1B1A Okay, so as you should have gleaned from that, Tahar assumes that the Y chromosomal haplogroup, the paternal haplogroup of Jacob, the biblical Jacob, the patriarch Jacob, was E1B1A. Now, he doesn't prove that. He doesn't give any reason to think that's true, but that, that's okay. That's for another discussion. Uh, I'm willing to work under that assumption uh, because the, the honest fact of the matter is that we have no idea what Jacob's paternal haplogroup was. So it could be anything. Now, where Tahar is correct is that if if Jacob had a certain paternal haplogroup and someone else does not have that Y chromosomal haplogroup, that, that marker, then that person does not descend paternally from Jacob. And that's an interesting point to keep in mind vis-a-vis -vis one West Israelites like Tahar because they assume that what makes you an Israelite is paternal lineage, strictly and only paternal lineage. So therefore, if your strict paternal line goes back to Jacob, then you're an Israelite on their view. And if it does not go back to Jacob, straight back to Jacob, then you are not an Israelite. And so that's an interesting uh, position to take. And now let's explore the implications of that. 
By the way, what Tahar was looking at there was a Wikipedia entry on uh, why DNA haplogroups amongst populations in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in the video description, I'll link to Tahar's video so you can get a better look at it. Uh, and I'll also link directly to the Wikipedia entry, but I'll also be showing clearer images in this video momentarily. But in the meantime... I'd like to look at something which I think Tahar will initially like before we get to the stuff that he might not like so much. And uh, that's this uh, Wikipedia's entry on genetic studies on Jews. So in this entry, you can scroll down uh, to a section on uh, why DNA amongst uh, Ashkenazi Jews. So we're going to focus on Ashkenazis in this uh, video. And there's just as Tahar had a helpful chart for sub-Saharan Africans, you, they also, this entry has a helpful chart for uh, why haplogroups found amongst Ashkenazim. So I'm going to zoom in on the chart here. We're going to focus on this chart. And just to explain what you're looking at, the different horizontal lines represent the findings of different genetic studies on Ashkenazim, on Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, and uh, the columns represent different haplogroups. So even though they were using different... Uh, sample sizes uh, and different sample sets, they, the different studies found roughly similar but still marginally different results. So for example, within a given haplogroup, one study might find that 20% uh, of Ashkenazis had a certain uh, paternal haplogroup, uh, while another study might find that 23% had that or 16% had that, etc. Now here's the part that Tahar and others like him are going to appreciate. Here's the part that they're going to like. Uh, no matter which study you side with, no matter which horizontal line you side with, and no matter which haplogroup you choose as to be the hypothetical paternal haplogroup of the patriarch Jacob, you're going to reach the same conclusion, which is that a majority of Ashkenazim do not descend paternally from Jacob. Now, this is the result that you reach, this is the conclusion that you'll reach, no matter which haplogroup you hypothetically assign to the patriarch Jacob. For example, let's assume, just for the sake of argument, let's assume that Jacob's haplogroup was E1B1B. Now, I know that Tahar wanted it to be E1B1A, but just for the sake of argument, let's assume it's E1B1B. According to this study, if that's Jacob's uh, haplogroup, only roughly 16 to 23 percent, let's say roughly 20 percent, a fifth of Ashkenazim should have that, that Y chromosomal marker which would mean that roughly 80% of Ashkenazi Jews do not descend from Jacob, at least not if we're working under the assumption that Jacob's uh, Y chromosomal haplogroup, his paternal haplogroup was E1B1B. However, you could take this a different way. Let's assume instead that, hypothetically speaking, Jacob's paternal haplogroup was J1, just for the sake of argument. Even there, only roughly a fifth, according to a bunch of different studies, roughly a fifth to a quarter of Ashkenazim have that Y chromosomal marker, which would mean that somewhere between three quarters to four fifths of, so 75 to 80 percent of Ashkenazim do not descend from Jacob, uh, at least not if we're working under the assumption that Jacob's paternal haplogroup was J1. Now, just to have a little fun to try and stack it in the favor of the Ashkenazi community, let's combine J1 and J2 into a general haplogroup J. Even if you did that, you still would not get a majority of Ashkenazim descending from that line, which would mean that even if we took a position that no geneticist would take, which is that Jacob somehow is the forefather of both J1 and J2, that Still, less than half of Ashkenazim show that general genetic marker, this general J genetic marker. So again, that would mean that a majority of Ashkenazim do not descend paternally from Jacob. Now, the point here is that, again, no matter which haplogroup you choose to hypothetically assign to Jacob, you're going to reach the same conclusion, which is that a majority of Ashkenazim do not descend from that paternal haplogroup, and therefore a majority of Ashkenazim do not descend from Jacob. Now, I think Tahar would like that. We have genetic evidence that a majority of Ashkenazim do not descend paternally. I should put emphasis on paternally. I mean, this uh, Y chromosomal studies don't tell us about other lines of lineage, and when you're going on uh, family trees on the span of millennia, obviously there's going to be literally uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lines of descent there. 
but focusing on strictly the strict paternal line, which is what a Y chromosomal study, a uh, haplogroup study will do, Y DNA study will do, is it'll show you the strict paternal line. Focusing just on the strict paternal line over and over again, no matter which haplogroup you choose, the same conclusion is reached. And again, that is that a majority of Ashkenazim do not descend paternally from Jacob, which would seem to imply that a majority of Ashkenazim descend paternally from converts. And I think that's something that Tahar would like. That's a, a position that he would enjoy. However, here's where it begins to get sticky for some of Tahar's other positions. While this does serve as a potential polemic against Ashkenazim, it also provides polemics against some of Tahar's other positions. So, for example, with the conclusion that we would reach is that Ashkenazim are not majority anything. So, just as a majority of them do not descend from Jacob, it would also mean that a majority of them do not descend from Esau. And that is Tahar's position, after all, that they're almost entirely Edomites. But that would clearly be wrong here. They don't descend, a majority of them do not descend from Esau. And that would be the conclusion you reach, no matter which haplogroup you assign to Esau. It also should cause one to take a more nuanced approach to the issue of the mass conversion of the Khazars and what contribution, what sort of genetic contribution Khazars made to the uh, diverse Ashkenazi community. Because unless the Khazars themselves were a very diverse group, the conclusion one would have to reach is that the majority of Ashkenazim also do not descend from Khazars. Now, just to be clear, that's not to deny that the Khazar mass conversion did not make a significant contribution to the Ashkenazi community, but it seems that if we assume the Khazars were a relatively homogenous group, then we would have to reach the conclusion that only a minority of Ashkenazim descend from the Khazars as well. Now, if one is confused as to how they could possibly be so diverse, uh, I'll just quickly say that the, throughout their history, they've accepted conversions. So just try to imagine a group of people accepting a trickle of converts over a span of many centuries in many locations on multiple continents. Once you consider what that buildup would lead to, then it becomes entirely plausible that they would be a diverse group which eventually would reach a point where no single paternal line uh, is dominant, is, uh, is, per is captured by the majority. So, but anyway, the point is, is that if someone says that the majority of Ashkenazim descend from Jacob, that seems to clearly not be the case, if, and maybe Tahar would like that. However, if someone like Tahar says the majority of Ashkenazim descend from Esau, that also is not the case. And even the claim that the majority of them are Khazars also seems to be potentially wrong, unless the Khazars, we assume they were a very diverse people. Whatever the case, we see that while there are aspects of genetic studies that Tahar might like, there are also aspects that work against positions which he's pushed and taught four decades. That aside, now let's look at the chart that Tahar was looking at, which was the, uh, from the Wikipedia entry on uh, Y DNA amongst populations in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, here I'm showing a slightly adapted, slightly edited version of the chart, but I'll uh, link both to, to Tahar's video and to the Wikipedia entry so people can look at the chart themselves. But the point is, is that yes, sub-Saharan African groups do show a number of different paternal lines. Tahar is right about that. So clearly it can't be the case that all of them descend from Jacob, which of course nobody was really arguing. But nonetheless, there is, the point is there is some genetic diversity, uh, considerable genetic diversity amongst sub-Saharan African groups. Nonetheless, uh, what we can still find some interesting details in that chart which Tahar appealed to. Like for example, just under half of Amhara, of the uh, a major ethnic group in Ethiopia, descend from uh, the paternal haplogroup E1B1B. Now, I know Tahar wanted to assign E1B1A to Israelites, but nonetheless, let's just note this for a second, that uh, just under half of Amhara descend from E1B1B. And so too, perhaps a third of them descend from the general line J. Now that could be J1 or J2, they're just showing the general line J, but nonetheless, the point remains that uh, roughly a third of Amhara uh, show this J marker, this paternal marker, Y-DNA marker J. And we see uh, similar results for the general population of, of Ethiopia, where more than two-fifths of the population uh, show this marker E1B1B, and uh, roughly a quarter of the population uh, bears this uh, Y chromosomal marker J, general marker J.
Now, this has some interesting implications. Uh, there are a number of people out there, I don't know if Tahar has taken this approach, but certainly a number of other Israelites have taken this approach, to note that Tacitus had uh, speculated that Jews may descend from Ethiopians. Now, Tacitus was writing near the dawn of the Common Era, so almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, but, you know, that excites certain groups. Of course, what's left out is that Tacitus gave a number of different possibilities. He said they could be Egyptians, they could be Assyrians, they could be from Crete, etc. But nonetheless, let's focus on the, on the Ethiopian guess or Ethiopian hypothesis that Tacitus put forward. The people who are excited by Tacitus uh, offering such a hypothesis will often take a stance of, along the lines of, Tacitus thought that the ancient Jews may have descended from Ethiopians, but nobody thinks today's Ashkenaz descend from Ethiopians. But let's consider what the genetic evidence actually points to, what it actually bears out. So just to keep the numbers nice and round, to make it a little bit easier, let's say there are roughly 10 million Ashkenazim in the world. And let's say there's about 100 million Ethiopians in the world. Now recall that 20% of Ashkenazim, roughly a fifth, so if we're saying about 2 million Ashkenazim, bear the paternal marker E1B1B. And that's also the case that roughly two-fifths, or 40 million people amongst the Ethiopians, bear that same paternal marker, that same Y-DNA haplogroup. So two, roughly 40%, so we're saying about four million Ashkenazim, bear the paternal marker J in one form or another. And so two, roughly a quarter of Ethiopians, so we're saying about 25 million people, also bear the general genetic marker J, whether it be J1 or J2 or whatever. What this shows us is that the Ashkenazim who bear the marker E1B1B are paternally closer to the Ethiopians who bear that marker than those Ashkenazim are to Ashkenazim who bear the marker J. And so too, the Ashkenazim who bear the paternal marker J are closer paternally to those Ethiopians, to those 40 million Ethiopians who bear the paternal marker J. And I think this is quite interesting because what we see is that paternally you have millions of Ashkenazim who are closely related to millions of Ethiopians and then you have millions of other Ashkenazim who are closely related to millions of other Ethiopians. There's still some genetic affinity when we focus on paternal lines. Now again, I think if we looked into all the other lines of lineage that come with a people group across millennia, there's going to be a lot of differences. So here we're just focusing on the paternal line. The salient point here is that you can't determine a person's paternal lineage across millennia simply by the way they look, their skin color, their hair texture, or even the way they behave. And you can find similar results with other groups which appeared on that chart which Tahar appealed to. For example, the Nubians slightly under a quarter bear the genetic marker uh, E1B1B while slightly over two-fifths bear the marker J. And by the way, this also shows that these groups, these different groups are also distinct from one another. There's diversity within the groups. Rather than saying there's diversity between different African groups, even within a single African population, whether it be Ethiopian, Nubian, or something else, we see there's also diversity within it. Getting back to that chart for Y-DNA amongst Ashkenazim, it's also worth noting that the various studies have shown that roughly 10% of Ashkenazim, so we're saying about a million Ashkenazim, bear the paternal marker R1B. Now, that's worthy of note because uh, the Fulbay people in Sudan, they have about slightly over half their population bearing the paternal marker R1B. So they have that in common. About a half of their population is somewhat closely related paternally to about a million Ashkenazim, while another third of their population is closely related paternally to about two million Ashkenazim of a different paternal line. This is interesting, and I think it also shows how complex this subject is and the fact that Tahar and other One Westers badly oversimplify the complexity of the world and the various people groups within it. 
that should be obvious just from this uh, comparison of Ashkenazim to the Fulbe that are in Sudan. You know, Tahar would probably wave one group off as mere Hamites and the other group off as mere Edomites. But we realize that each group is actually complex in terms of paternal DNA, emphasis on paternal, on the paternal line, Y DNA, where one portion of the Fulbe people is closely related to one portion of the Ashkenaz, the Ashkenazim. And meanwhile, a different portion of the Fulbe are closely related related to a different portion of the Ashkenazim. Another place where this causes problems for Tahar's doctrines is the 12 tribes chart. Note that Tahar's position was essentially that E1B1A is the genetic marker, the paternal genetic marker of Jacob, and therefore even if someone bears the closely related DNA marker, Y DNA marker, E1B1B, that person does not descend from Jacob. Okay, that's fine. But then that begs the question, what about Native Americans? You know, the, all these different tribes, Aztecs and Tainos and stuff like that, that appear on the 12 tribes chart. I mean, a great many of them are in completely different uh, haplogroup families. Some of them are from C. The vast majority of them, it seems, are from haplogroup Q. And therefore... The argument that Tahar had against various African groups also applies to many people on his own 12 tribes chart. So, in conclusion, Tahar's approach raises a number of questions. For example, here's a question for Tahar. If E1B1A is the Y-DNA haplogroup for Israelites, what would be the Y-DNA haplogroup for Edomites? Here's a related two-part question for Tahar. Did Jacob have the same Y-DNA haplogroup as his father Isaac? Did Esau have the same Y-DNA haplogroup as Isaac? Now, the reason why this is an important question is because it's at least plausible to assume that Jacob and Esau would have had the same paternal haplogroup as they had the same father. And yes, this is an, an issue also for people who try to assign any haplogroup to Jacob, because even if you find a person with that haplogroup, that could just be an Edomite convert. Whatever the case, I'd like to see Tahar's answer to this, though I bet if he did answer, he might try to say, well, they, were, they gave rise to two different nations, so the Most High slightly altered the genetic marker of Esau. But if that's the case, I'd still like to know, what is the Edomite genetic marker? What is the Y-DNA haplogroup of Edomites? And here's another question, this one specifically for Tahar, since he was the one who went down this road. Have you looked into why DNA haplogroups found amongst Latinos? Or have you looked into why DNA haplogroups found amongst Native Americans, whether they be in North America, South America, or, uh, you know, Central America, the indigenous peoples of the Americas? Have you looked into that? I'd like to see how you reconcile the diversity of haplogroups found amongst these broad groups with your 12 tribes chart and also with the approach that you took to the diversity of Y-DNA haplogroups found amongst sub-Saharan Africans. However, if I were to guess which way Tahar is going to go with this once he's forced to face the complexity of DNA studies, I think he's just going to wave the science off and say that knowing who is and is not an Israelite is a thing of faith, a, a thing of the Well, spirit. we believe this. We don't need no research and stacks of books. We, we, we know that we're Israelites based upon the spirit. This is a spiritual thing. We have a spiritual connection to the book. All right? Yeah, Tell us which one people. of the crowd are Israelites. Well, I'm assuming oh, I don't know. That's through the spirit. Okay. That's through the spirit. Can you break it down, we believe, though? We believe that we're Israelites, right. but we'll find out when the Mosai comes and separate it. Matter of fact, give me... Um, so whoever agrees with us. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Give me the fifth. No, we believe that we're Israelites, yeah. just like we believe the Hebrew that we speak. But the, the Hebrew that we speak is based upon faith. It's Nobody all based upon faith.